Industry on Parade, a brand new look at our America, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. At Newark, Delaware, Industry on Parade visits the $2 million home of a department of the DuPont Company, a department that produces nothing and sells nothing. The major concern of this branch of the firm is health and safety, the health and safety of employees and of customers who buy or use the company's products. Here in the Haskell Laboratory for Toxicology and Industrial Medicine, tests of all kinds go on endlessly. For example, this test is designed to find out exactly how much energy is consumed in performing various workloads. The workload is determined by the amount of friction on the rear wheel. What the man puts out from second to second is indicated by his blood pressure, oxygen consumption, chest expansion, and other factors. Also used a long-range program to learn how industrial workers can avoid undue fatigue is the LaRue platform, a device mounted on quartz crystals which record every change of pressure on the platform and permit close analysis of the movements of a person standing on it. To prevent injury or illness from chemicals or manufacturing processes, Rats and guinea pigs are exposed to an atmosphere in which the gas, liquid or solid under study, is suspended. Despite the gas mask, the atmospheres pumped into the bell jar are rarely outright poisonous. Although any substance, even salt or baking soda, can be toxic if taken in too great a dose. That's what they're trying to find out. How much is too much? The effects of chemicals on the body can vary under extremes of temperature and humidity. So here, those factors are introduced. In the course of their studies, the researchers have come up with a superior type of one-layer arctic clothing. Another byproduct of industrial integrity that prompts companies to go far beyond the requirements of law in protecting the public health and comfort. America's new frontiers are pushed back every day somewhere in this country through research. Each year, industry spends two and a half billion dollars in research to discover new products or improve those already on the market. These new and improved products mean better and less expensive things for all of us, but more important, they mean more and better jobs with an ever greater chance for better living for everybody. This can happen only in America, where industry is free to experiment, where men know they can refuse to accept limitation, where we have a competitive enterprise system in which nothing is impossible. The green at Waterbury, Connecticut. Sprinklers that keep this and other city lawns green all summer were contributed by one of the town's leading industries. Needless to say, sprinklers are among the products made by the contributing firm, Scoville Manufacturing Company. A sprinkler is a little thing, but making it involves some mighty big operations, like the extrusion of rods in this 2,000-ton hydraulic press. As pressure mounts past the 3,500 pound mark, the metal squirts out like toothpaste and is taken up on reels. At this point, the metal is still red hot, so the job of moving it out of the way is handled by machine. The rod, cut to length just a couple of inches long, will be used for making sprinkler heads for one of the latest models in the firm's green spot line. Serrations will be cut in the metal and holes drilled in the serrations to throw water evenly over every inch of the area to be sprinkled. Elsewhere in the big plant, other parts are fabricated and assembled, like couplers. A sprinkler used to be an extremely simple gadget, but it has grown more complex as a result of increased demands made on it. You'd be amazed at the amount of engineering that has gone into this little device.
The big gear is an impeller gear. Water striking it causes the sprinkler heads to swing back and forth in uniform sweeps. The second sprinkler head is installed. The parts all have been so accurately machined that they fit together as neatly as a Chinese puzzle. We've been using the word sprinkler pretty steadily here, but actually the Scoville people wish the public would adopt a better word. For, they point out, a lawn shouldn't be merely sprinkled, it should be soaked. A light sprinkling can be damaging. Now goes on one of those modern improvements we mentioned, a control dial that regulates exactly the distance the spray is thrown. There's an abundance of gaskets and packing to keep the unit watertight permanently, so the water will go where it's supposed to and not form a small lake right around it. The two halves are secured together, and the product is complete except for the addition of a base. Another interesting fact about lawn watering we picked up here in Waterbury is that, contrary to general opinion, the best time to water a lawn is not in the evening, but in the early morning hours. Excessive moisture during the night, they say, can cause brown patch and other fungus diseases. Live and learn. No matter what time it may be, though, here's one family that isn't going to wait for early morning to try out their new lawn sprinkler. They're really well equipped with attachments for every special purpose. Don't watch it too long, folks. You'll be hypnotized. Three Longview Washington industrialists with a dream of the future. A future in which motorists can break through the 40 mile an hour speed barrier prevailing on the nation's highways by taking their cars above the highways, up into the sky. On the ground, the aero car, as they call it, can drive freely like any other automobile, or it can tow the wing and tail sections behind it. To take off, merely swing the wings in place, turn a few handles, and you're ready to go. We called it a dream of the future. But actually, the aero car is already in production and may be seen in use on the streets and in the air. As an automobile, its appearance is rather unusual, but as an airplane, it looks pretty much like conventional models. The vehicles are turned out here at the company's plant in Longview. Handmade units produced so far have been mostly for demonstration purposes to build a backlog of orders that will permit assembly line operations and bring down costs. Now let's take one of the flying automobiles up and see how it performs in the wild blue yonder. The changeover involves about as much work as changing a tire. The wingspan is 34 feet, and as an airplane, the craft is 21 feet long. Gross flying weight is 1,900 pounds, of which about 400 pounds is payload. So now we're all set. The changeover took about four minutes. Moulton Taylor, who designed the aero car, is going to be our pilot on this flight of what he is firmly convinced is the car of the future. The pusher-type propeller is powered by a 135-horsepower engine that will get the craft up to 110 miles an hour or better. It cruises at a little more than 100. A few minutes ago, it was an automobile winding through traffic. Now it soars over lakes, mountains, and cities. 
Maybe Taylor has something with his talk about the car of the future. One thing is certain, you aren't stopped by many red lights up here. In the past, as America's population has grown, its natural resources developed. New industries came into being. More and more people invested their savings in plant, tools, and machines. This, in turn, permitted employees in industrial plants to increase their output through the use of mechanical power, newer and faster machines, as well as better production techniques. When the assembly line was introduced, it brought with it better testing and inspecting methods. These not only permitted the employees to increase their output, but enabled them to improve the quality of goods they turned out, and their wages and standard of living continued to climb. The New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, one of the great music schools of the country, heavily supported since its founding 87 years ago by leading industrialists of the Northeast. Here, young people gather from all parts of the country to become indoctrinated in the creation of fine music and the recreation of the music of masters like Beethoven, whose statue looks down upon them as they pass to and from classes. Harrison Keller, president of the conservatory, recounts some of its history. At the start of his studies here, a student plays a number of instruments, eventually concentrating on the one he himself selects. He learns to play with other instrumentalists and often to write his own pieces. The very young are encouraged to experiment, at home usually, with the making of their own instruments. This increases their general musical understanding, acquainting them with the basic ways in which musical sounds are produced. The instruments they come up with, like the triangle, formed from the length of curtain rod, or the drum, fashioned out of a tin can and two pieces of inner tube, bear a strong resemblance to primitive musical instruments in use all over the world. A pie plate and a few bottle caps make a tambourine, while a handful of marbles and a gourd become a Mexican rattle. Soon as we get the musical tumblers in proper tune, we'll sit back and listen to what these instruments all sound like in the hands of their young creators. Keeping all factors in mind, we're sure you won't expect to hear the Boston Symphony. <laughs> 